Well, I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm glad to see you here today. We have a terrific group of guests, the panel, covering a fascinating, deep topic. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation. But for the topic, we're thinking, thinking about redesign and design thinking and how to make teaching and learning even better with technology and in other ways. We have a great group of authors who are both scholars and practitioners who are all here to help us and to explain what their own research is. If you look in the bottom left corner of the screen, you can see a kind of mustard colored button that says rewriting writing. And that links to one of their papers, which is a deep analysis of a workshop and a new method of teaching writing, which is very exciting. And they have more research to come. So what's gonna happen now is one by one, I'm gonna bring them up on stage so that they can quickly introduce themselves in our special patented future transform way. And then we can have you put questions to them. So to begin with, let me bring up Mike Garn. Hello, Mike. Hey, John. hello. It's good to see you way up, nearly in the upper peninsula of the state of Michigan. Yes, I am. I'm coming to you live from the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island. Wow, I envy you. It must be gorgeous out there right now. It is a beautiful spring day. The Forsythia is out, and yeah. it's just a wonderful place. Well, I'm, I envy you that, and I'm also grateful for you taking an hour out of that experience to join us in the virtual world. Mike, the, the, the way we ask people to introduce themselves is actually unique. We ask people not to describe their current position or their job title, but to describe what you're going to be working on for the next year. And what are the big ideas that you're likely to be spending most of your time thinking about? And what are the big projects you're going to be working on? Well, thanks, Brian. You know, uh, actually, I'm up here, as you can see, on a competency-based education network. Uh, retreat and, and we're really talking about what we're going to be doing for the next uh, actually two to five years so uh, and a lot of exciting things in the competency-based area uh, oh, my work in the last couple of years has uh, moved more into uh, using artificial intelligence uh, along with uh, knowledge skills and abilities linking those together and one of my big projects right now I'm the principal investigator on an NSF uh, Artificial Intelligence Institute for Adult Learning and uh, Online Education. Oh, so uh, a lot of big things coming up in the next year. Oh, indeed. That sounds terrific. We'd lo love to hear more about that. Thank you. Thank you. But let, me, let me bring up your colleagues. And in fact, let me clear some space up here on the board and make sure that uh, everyone can fit. And let me add to um, our growing roster. Uh, let me bring up uh, Karen Vignare. And she's probably going to correct me because I have just stumbled right all over her name um let's see what she welcome karen hi brian and that is close enough and hi mike it's good to see you guys and <laughs> thanks audience for being here uh, um vinyari it's usually like think of wines right vineyard that's the it way works. to do it right it works. <laughs> oh listening to mike it was a, a little bit hard for me to think of all the things that i might be doing that's exciting um but i'm uh more or less still working in the um with the ai work but in the adaptive learning and mm -hmm. um, learning analytics work so we expect to be doubling down. One of the things we think a lot about is not only have faculty been working um, incredibly hard over the last two years, but we still don't have enough of the quote unquote right tools for them to determine when students need help and how to get that help to them really quickly. Um, and their workload is just huge. And if we don't give them the right kind of tools, we really can't help them save the students uh, and help them succeed. So I'm kind of excited to be working on that as well. Interesting. Uh, Karen, if you get a chance, uh might be curious, might be interesting for you. We just did a blog post yesterday uh, based on a crowdsource query of someone looking for a simple tool to help them make an online class outside of schools. And sure. It was a lot, a lot of fun to go through. Uh, that sounds great, Karen. Um, Karen Dignare. Um, and thank you. And where are you coming from today? Oh, uh, Washington, D.C. We're on our first of what will probably be many heat waves, right? Uh, so, so we had wonderful wet 
spring weather. Wow. And then today it's 85 and then the next three days it'll be in the 90s so i know a few people in the chat said sweltering in texas but you know typical dc weather where we go from i think earlier in the week we were around 40 yeah. to 95 by the end of the week where where in dc is uh, aplu and uh, dupont uh, aplu is uh, we have moved to 12th and uh, uh l street uh, uh so we're pretty much what is considered downtown um, but it's always a lot of fun because I go walking around uh, monuments yeah. in the mall and I get to see the White House every now and then. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, yeah, I'm not too far from you. I teach at Georgetown and uh, Wesson and I live on different places in the D.C. area. So we'll swelter with you um, <laughs> and welcome. Welcome. I'm really glad to see you. Uh, let me bring up some more people from this panel. Uh, we're this may be the biggest panel we've ever done. So let's 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 see how big it gets. Let's see how many people we can hold at once. Uh, let's bring up uh, Rob Cadell, and let me see if I got the name right. Rob, is it Cadell or Cattle? Uh, it is Cadell. Well, welcome, Rob Cadell from the Georgia Institute of Technology. How are you this afternoon, sir? I am well. Thank you very much for having us on, Brian. Um, our pleasure. Our pleasure. So uh, I actually went through a bit of a career transition about nine months ago, shortly oh. after we completed uh, the, the uh, reports that, that we'll be discussing today. Um, so I'm, I'm working more in administration now at Georgia Tech, mm -hmm. uh, not so much in online learning, but uh, it's, it's still, um, it's highly relevant, I think, because as I read through um, your newsletter uh, of your blog posts, which if, folks, if you're not subscribed to Brian's newsletter, please go to his website and subscribe. It's excellent. And um, so when you're talking about things like which school will be the first to charge $100,000 for tuition, it's not going to be Georgia Tech, I can tell you that. No. Uh, but those are the kinds of, uh, of, of topics that I seem to be cued into these days. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, what are you administering, if I may ask? Uh, I am uh, doing the research program in interdisciplinary research. So uh, we have 10 interdisciplinary research institutes at Georgia Tech. Uh, and uh, we have a vice president, Julia Kubanik, who is in charge of all of those. And I am sort of her uh, chief operating officer, you might say. So I, I get things done across all those institutes. Getting things done is a great thing. And you help other people get things done. Um, and so the work we've been talking about here today, uh, you're managing, I think, to diffuse it through the institution. Fantastic. Well, welcome, Rob. Um, glad to see you. Um, and let me see if I can bring up some more people because oh, we are just crowded with geniuses today. Uh, let's see if, if we can bring up. Hello, Rashawn. Hi, everyone. How are you all? Good oh, afternoon. We're, we're great now that you're here. How are you doing? I'm good. Also, I want to say thank you, Wesson. I have figured out how to hear <laughs> to unplug from the monitor. So thank you. Thank you, Wesson. And uh, and Rishon, first of all, is it Rishon? Did I get that right? Yeah, you're spot on. And Rishon, thank you for your patience and for joining us. So, so tell us, at, at APLU, what are you going to be working on for the next year? Sure. Yeah. So uh, APLU, I'm currently a senior associate. So I work with Karen um, in supporting um, some of those coursework projects. Um, uh, wow. I've been there for the past two years. So yeah, it's been it's been really interesting, but also really meaningful work, especially uh, speaking with faculty and and kind of figuring out where courseware can continue to be personalized. Um, so I I think the future can certainly be bright, but I think it's also really important to have that uh, specific feedback for people who are working on the ground. So, yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, well, that sounds like terrific work. We may, um, and very seriously, we may just follow up with all of you um, this fall or this winter uh, to see what you've discovered and what you've identified. Um, and are you also, you're also based in DC? I'm, I'm seeing some boxes nearby. And, yes. Um, yeah, Karen and I are actually feet away from each other. Uh, we're, we're in the office. Hello. <laughs> um, but yeah, she is right. It's been a heat wave. I think this, this Saturday might be 98. So for those in the chat wishing they were working here, maybe not during this season, but certainly come down and visit, of course. I hear that. I hear that. Well, welcome. And I'm, I'm glad to see you here. Um, let me uh, let me now add um, the last, but definitely not least, number of our of our panel today. This is Elizabeth Lopez coming to us from Georgia State University. And 
here we go. Hello, Professor Lopez. Hello, how are you all? Oh, great, great. How are you doing this afternoon? I am well. Um, I'm in Atlanta, so it's it's also warm here. Uh, DC doesn't have the corner on the market of humidity at the moment. This is true. Um, so I'll, I'll just quickly, given your question, say I worked on an adaptive learning project with the APLU starting in 2016. Um, and then through that work, uh, I ended up um, meeting Mike and working on a project with Mike and Rob, and my life will never be the same. Um, <laughs> I'm assuming that's a good thing. It, absolutely. I think that, you know, as someone who comes to this work from 30 years of classroom teaching and 10 years of supervising teachers doing curriculum design and being an administrator in, in a university setting, I am so interested in the question of how we can teach writing um, better and uh, allow for students to succeed, allow for teachers to do this work more easily. And I feel that we're at this really perfect moment to be ta talking about this. So I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I agree. I agree. Well, welcome, welcome. And uh, we, I, I'm pushing the limits of uh, of what I've done with the technology before, by the way. So you can see we have this like not quite Brady Bunch effect. We've got something else going on. But what what I'd like to do is I'd like to begin by putting to all of you a, a couple of starting questions. And the way we do this in the forum is I ask you a question, you all cut loose, and then everyone in the forum gets to put their questions to you. Uh, so what, what I'd like to start with is to ask all of you, and whoever wants to answer this, please just, just you know, you go ahead. Um, what is digital forward design in education? What does that mean? Elizabeth, I've got, I've made you go last, and I've got you on the screen. Do, do you want to take a whack at this, or should I click over to somebody else? What do you think? How about I, I'll say two things and then um, be quiet and let the others sort of... Um, <laughs> I mean, I think one of the themes we've talked a great deal about in, in our work so far together is technology takes sort of a center stage, not because we're trying to minimize the, the instructor in any way or the student experience in any way, but because we're really focusing on what role technology can play in making a big difference um, in how we design courses, how students experience instruction, how they're served instruction. Um, and so rather than sort of focus on traditional uh, techniques of designing a class, um, we're really thinking about sort of the, the technology piece and what it can do to enhance what students need and what uh, teachers can, can serve. That is digital forward design. Thank you, thank you. Um, Lee, who, who, should I, who should I pick next? Who's the most likely suspect, Elizabeth? Well, such I'll, 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 I'll pick up next on that. Let's put him. Let's, let's put Mike on stage. Let's do that. Please go ahead, Mike. So uh, I, I think digital forward started out uh, really as kind of a challenge, uh, and, and you know it came from conversations Karen and I had uh, several years ago about you know we've done really good things with adaptive uh, learning and math. Uh, but one of the things we found out is that they're frequently the adaptive tools are kind of in the background. Uh, mm -hmm. The class is kind of what we call instructor forward. And mm -hmm. if the tools aren't really well integrated uh, into the course, students may or may not use them. And that means they may or may not be effective. And so the better faculty could integrate things in, uh, the, the more effective the adaptive tools were in helping the students learn. And, you know, the, the challenge really became, well, what if we designed a course that was more, uh, we started with adaptive forward, well, that really that was, uh, had a, a more central role in the instruction, uh, because uh, we thought we could learn quite a bit from doing that. Uh, one of the things that we did learn is the technologies, it's not just about adaptive learning. There's a whole range of technologies that fit into that. So that's really where we got to the, the digital forward idea. And we felt that, uh, there, you know, we know from uh, a lot of uh, anecdotal evidence and research that the two courses that make the biggest difference for uh, students coming in, uh, either good or bad, uh, is math and writing. Hmm. And while we had a lot hmm. of digital tools in math uh, and tools that help students work on their own and work productively, 
uh, there wasn't, there weren't as many of those kind of tools available, and there really wasn't a model for that in writing. So that's really, it, it became kind of this challenge of uh, what would it take to design a writing course that was really, truly digital forward? That's a fascinating idea. I mean, computers and, and technology for writing go back to the 1990s with like the Journal of Computers and Composition. Um, but what, what you're seeing is that it needs to be done much more uh, extensively, uh, more creatively. I'll, I'll let Karen take, take that one. <laughs> uh, happy to do that. Happy to do that. Oh, oh Mike always turns it over at, at a prime time. Um, I, I just want to jump back from Elizabeth's standpoint because, I mean, again, we start in this work knowing um, uh, faculty are dedicated like uh, Elizabeth. And I, I, I'm not going to sit here because I already see in the chat there's a few people who say the better faculty. Uh, um, Elizabeth is a better faculty. I'm not going to disagree that there aren't differences in faculty, but I am going to say with tools, I think all faculty can get better, right? And I think that's what we owe higher education. And our ideas around digital forward was that um, students don't always have the choice of quote unquote, or know which one is going to be the better faculty, right? Uh, um, and so we have to really think about ways where the classroom um, is supported um, and students are supported uh, um, uh, it, where we design in, and I like Mike's term, integrated and implemented um, the tools so that they are rather seamless, right? And what that means is as they go through the process of writing, which I am not a writing Oh, I just heard a little bit of background noise. That's okay. Um, you I'll think talk you about it. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think I think that the point is when we have these tools, we can also do something really important, and that is provide faculty with data. We believe huh. that faculty yeah. need data about their students, and in an analog scenario, no matter how hard they work. They could offer an assessment every single day. They can't get the data that they need about what students really need in terms of support. And Digital Forward is all about figuring out how to support student and student learning. Because again, we start with this learning centeredness that uh -huh. Uh -huh. people are able to learn. So Digital Forward is all about the fact that we have some great tools, and I'm not going to disagree that they're not perfect tools, but we have some great tools that are beginning to help faculty understand where students have um, issues or where they don't understand things or the fact that they're not active enough to be learning. And all of those things become incredibly important resources uh, for faculty to then do what faculty do well, and that is instructs. They can go say to a student, I see you're stopped here. What can I do to help you? How do I turn on the wheels that are natural in your brain? Um, and how do I move you forward? And so digital forward is, you know, I often say it's actually very, very simple. It's about getting faculty the data they need so that they can help students learn. That there's so much in what all of you have just said, everything from big data to uh, process uh, to neurology, I think, and design thinking. Um, Steve Ehrman in the chat uh, corrects me. Uh, I mentioned computers and composition from the 90s, and he points out that computers and writing conference began in the early 80s. Uh, so thank you, Stephen. Uh, we have more questions coming up, but I want to make sure that we give uh, Rob Kiddell a chance to uh, speak because he's burning to add to this. Go ahead, Rob. <laughs> Uh, I just uh, wanted to add one other perspective that we had at the beginning of the, the project because we spent a little bit of time talking about scale and, and whether or not the, the digital forward, as we described it, um, process was, a, was something that could be used to actually increase the scale of a course. And uh, to a certain extent, I think that depends on the, the, the subject area, the knowledge domain. Uh, and when you look at teaching writing and, and composition, 
Um, scale in terms of the number of students isn't necessarily a good thing. You, you need to have uh, a much more, if you will, intimate relationship between instructor and students so that they can get to know your writing style, they can provide feedback that is personalized to you and so forth. And so when we talked about scale, it wasn't so much about scaling up the numbers of students, but scaling the, the number of opportunities to write uh, and to get feedback. Uh, and so that's where a lot of these tools kind of come into place is it, it, it is designed to kind of help uh, writing instructors say, we're going to give you a chance to, to, to get through six different big assignments this semester. You're going to have a chance to get feedback on all of them, you know, but without putting the entire burden of that feedback on that single instructor. Okay. Okay. This is, this is, friends, if you haven't read the paper, um, don't read it right now, but definitely, you know, that bookmark it, tab it, and uh, the, you, you can see each person here has added a different aspect to it. There's a lot going on. Um, this is a very, very ambitious uh, system. In the chat, people have been making all kinds of comments, and I, I want to bring out a couple of these. Uh, in fact, a couple of questions. This is one from our dear friend and uh, author, Tom Hames. Uh, and Tom says, or asks, how do we better align the tasks of teaching with the technology that supports them? Should we design for tasks first and technology second? Who wants to tackle? Rob, we've got you on the on the camera right now. You want to give that a whack or uh, or? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, it it in in some ways this this uh, is is kind of gets back to um, uh, user experience design kind of principles where you think about are we designing from the functionality perspective or are we designing uh, right. uh, in order to address a particular uh, a particular need. And um, I, I think the way that, that we approached this, although I, I won't say that there was consensus on this in, in the workshop that we held, uh, was that, that you needed to think about what the tasks were first and, and not think about what tool can I kind of cram into my course, if you will, to, to mm -hmm. have some sort of digital experience for the students. And fortunately, as, as our workshop participants work through those tasks, um, you know, we we made lots and lots of lists of these kinds of things and then found that there are a number of tools that address the different kinds of tasks uh, in different ways. Well, Tom, if, uh, if that answers yeah. your question. Oh, please, go ahead. Brian, let, let me expand on that a little bit and then maybe sure. send it over to Rashan to talk about our process, too. Uh, you know, we, we did uh, several sessions uh, Friday afternoons working with people and we, we focused each time uh, on a particular journey, like the stu student journey. What it, did it look like? And we used a lot of visual tools to kind of follow the student through that course. Uh, then we looked at the faculty uh, journey, if you will, uh, of what teaching that was like. So uh, those proved as uh, good, as Rob said, starting with the tasks and then thinking about where, where does technology fit into that? And I, I don't want uh, anyone to think that it was just uh, the, the five of us sitting there uh, thinking these things up, or four of us. Uh, there were a lot of people involved, and Rashawn uh, is on. Uh, she uh, had the glamorous title uh, as Wrangler. So, Rashawn, maybe you want to talk about uh, all of the people and how we got them involved in the project. Wranglers always win. Um. <laughs> Um, yeah, I take that take on that title with honor uh, for sure. But yeah, I, yeah, I think to expand on Mike's part a little bit, we did do some outreach to different um, universities and, and just colleges and different institutions, both four and two year. Um, so we did have uh, representation across the board. Um, and when we did these workshops, we had time to kind of um, create some collaboration and, and some deep conversations. Um, and I think because uh, we, we hosted several workshops, right? Um, but I think what we also found um, after kind of the feedback and just debriefing with one another is that because everyone is coming from a different institution, they also have different resources and uh, courses are taught differently there. And, and so I think it really played into hand of what Digital Forward even means to the institution itself mm -hmm. versus just yeah. um, kind of branding it as a, as a catch-all definition, right? And I think to Rob's point, but also to... Um, what Elizabeth said earlier too, I think when you 
think about digital forward, I think oftentimes um, technology obviously is, is a big component there, but also from um, our conversations that we had with faculty, they are also able to share the tools that they are using, right? And that's and that's nice because we have a really yeah. large list of tools that are already existing and already doing certain functions. But of course, there's so many tools yeah. because there's not one tool to fit all of the needs. Um, but, I, yeah. but I think too, it's also really important about um, kind of you know, diving into this exploratory zone of what um, digital forwardness could mean is also just starting at the basis of, it's not just instructional designers developing something, right? It needs to be a collaborative process um, to kind of expand and open up the door of what that could look like in the future, but also to make sure it's sustainable. So it's not just a one task per tool, it's more of a encompassing an, an, all, an all encompassing one. How do you how do you do that last part? I mean, how how do you make this sustainable? Oh, Brian, <laughs> um, I think that's a good question. I think this is kind of we're scratching some new surfaces. I don't think that technology is new by any means, and I don't think that we're having new conversations. But I think specifically after this pandemic, we're realizing that courses that were not originally meant to be taught online can't just be flipped and you know crammed into uh, some some online s spaces or, or courseware unfortunately so i think maybe and this is also coming from i, I think on this panel i might be the only one that i've never that has never taught right so i think that's also awesome. from a different perspective too but i think that i know that it's easy to say that these conversations need to be held but i also think uh, it probably comes from having conversations with administrators and faculty and, and kind of support and, and funding for these for these things to be expansive and sustainable too. Indeed, um, thank you. Uh, it makes me think about higher education's post pandemic commitment to improving teaching, but at the same time, our, our financial stresses. Um, yeah. And just, just one word, I, I should take a step back really quickly. Um, I mean, a couple of you work for the uh, APLU, the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. Um, and if I understand, that's a membership organization uh, that works with all the many uh, public universities across the U.S. that were funded by the uh, Morrill Grant. Um, and and your, what's your role in all of this work? Uh, we, we've heard about these workshops and everything. Are you a funder, a convener, an organizer? Yeah, so the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, is, as Brian just said, um, did. It, actually, the association didn't start with the Morrill Grant in uh, 1862, but the association started much later in the um, early 1900s um, mm -hmm. and represented all public universities. At a certain point, we we in ASCU uh, um, sort of said, okay, we have different purviews and and, but we still work very, very closely with all public universities. Um, and our work um, uh, in APLU is very member driven, but in the last um, 10 years, we, we, do have, um, we do have a president who is, is retiring, uh, um, Peter McPherson. And we're pleased to say that uh, um, our incoming president is Mark Becker, who is um, associated with prior um, greatness at uh, Georgia State University and oh. great people like Elizabeth. Uh -huh. and, and APLU is working around student success um, and um, equitable outcomes. And um, our work with um, personalized learning started back in about 2014. And we continue to work in this area of both um, things like academic advising, um, transferability, affordability, but we also work on the academic and digital tool side. And that's the work that I mostly focus on with Rashawn here. Oh, very, very good. Not all membership associations in higher education have that kind of focus on technology. I'm, I'm really going to focus on technology. I'm really definitely need to circle back with you um, and, and to hear more about this. Um, friends, by the way, this is an example, if you're new to the forum, of, of how participants get to ask questions in that uh, text box. Now I've got another one to uh, flash on the screen for everyone. This is from our friend John Hollenbeck. And John asks, we were using collaborative docs in Google 10 years ago for writing remediation. Was that digital forward? Isn't from there, it's a curriculum issue, not a digital issue? Who wants to tackle John's comment? Well, 
Well, I'll start, and other people can correct me as, as we go along. Uh, it was certainly uh, uh, utilization uh, of digital. I think uh, what we're seeing, and I don't think anyone believes we'll see less technology uh, in our courses uh, as we move forward. Uh, what we're seeing is more artificial intelligence, uh, algorithmic tools, uh, cognitive tutors, and things like that coming in. And I, th I think what we're really looking for uh, at this point uh, with this workshop, we were looking for what, what are those things people are seeing? We had a presentation by Peter Foltz uh, mm -hmm. at the Colorado Univ or University of Colorado and uh, also uh, has worked with Pearson for a number of years. And he's got an essay on there in there on essay scoring and how that works. I think there are a number of technologies that uh, are more effective than we'd like to believe, hmm. uh, and certainly uh, more threatening uh, than we'd like. Huh. Uh, and I, so part of this was, was an attempt to uh, begin thinking about where would some of those things fit in? Uh, how could we automate some of the rubrics uh, that we use for writing? Uh, you know, what parts of a rubric could be automated now, might be automated in the future? Uh, so it was it was a real challenge to better than 30 people uh, that we brought in to think through this. Uh, you know, I, and I want to say one of the things that came out of this uh, was uh, we came up with a set of principles for digital forward design. Uh, they really uh, this is we asked people to help us kind of if you were thinking about digital forward, what are the things you really ought to be focusing on? And I'll just real quickly read our list, uh, but there's much more description, of course, in the paper, in the report. But they're equity, engagement, interaction, instruction, process and practice, feedback, timelines, availability, tutoring and remediation, flexibility, scalability, and evidence-based decision-making. And we really talk about what you should think about in those areas. And last thing I'll say on that, uh, we intentionally put equity first because uh -huh. often that's like the landscaping when you build a new house. By the time you get to that, you've run out of money. So we spent a good part of our one of our sessions talking about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion and what that meant uh, for digital forward design. Well, thank you, Mike. That's a that's a great answer, um, John. I, I I hope that gives you a, a, a good response. Uh, if you want to jump in and say more, click the, click the raised hand. But speaking of... Hey, uh, uh, Brian, can I just ask? Sure. I mean, I think John is also Absolutely. pointing out uh, um, there have been a lot of, uh, of innovative faculty, which I'm guessing John um, fits in that. Uh, but I do think it's a curriculum issue as well. And when I say curriculum, one of the things that mm -hmm. we do here at APLU is whenever we do projects, we um, require that the teams joining us recognize a pilot to scale type of scenario. That is, we certainly want your individual champions, your piloters, your innovators to, mm -hmm. to start with us. But if we have an evidence base that this work is moving um, in the direction of improving student success, we want a commitment by the department that this is going to be integrated in the curriculum across all the courses. So I, I, I don't want to say some of you weren't pioneers using incredible tools that actually haven't been replaced, wiki spaces. Um, but I do want to say we're back to, and, and Tom and I were having that conversation around um, scaling and sustainability, and it remains a huge problem in higher ed. I, I agree. Um, I agree with all of that. Um, Elizabeth wants to join in. But by the way, if you're seeing weird fuzzy blobs around me, it's not a screen artifact. It's uh, one, one of our cats um, is, is absolutely <laughs> shameless. Um, I thought that was your production assistant. Uh, <laughs> no, this is a different production assistant. Uh, Elizabeth, please. I just realized I was doing the old school, literally raising my hand. Anyway, uh, kind of funny for a technology talk, isn't it? So I'm thinking about um, listening to my colleagues speak the idea that the possibility of an adaptive platform and, and AI also puts technology in a different position than 
uh, this may be controversial than something like the Google Doc, right? That I think, you know, the use of Google Doc um, encourages collaboration and inter student and teacher interaction in really powerful ways. But the possibilities brought to us by adaptive platforms and AI mean that the technology takes on a more substantive role. Um, and, you know, uh, we've had many conversations internally about this. I mean, I, I see that as a, as a positive because I firmly believe that still puts the student and the instructor in a really critical place. And that if we see that the technology has the ability to do some work for students and teachers, that means students and teachers can focus on other things, right? Yep. So that if, if, a, if an adaptive platform has the ability to give student feedback on a piece of writing in the middle of the night when a student wants it and the teacher is not available and the teacher has already um, focused on sort of more critical uh, instructional tasks, isn't that a beautiful thing, right? Um, so it becomes more of a win-win-win putting the technology in more of a sort of critical place. Um, I'm thinking about the theories of Andrew Feenberg that have talked about the, that mm -hmm. kind of notion of technology for years. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I, we have a couple of folks who wanted to join us on stage, and uh, uh, I wanted to bring up one of them, our good friend, uh, former guest, and uh, all around wonderful researcher, uh, Stephen Ehrman. So let's see if we have room for him on top of the program. Ah, we, that, that actually maxes us out. So I'm going to actually uh, really, really quickly make a little bit of room. Uh, I'm going to temporarily uh, get Rob out of the way. He just volunteered. Um, and let's, uh, let's bring up Stephen Ehrman. Hello, Stephen. Hi, Brian. How are you? And uh, hi from all my friends on the panel. Good to see you all again. Uh, my knowledge of computers and writing is a lot richer for the 20th century than the 21st. Um, so this is a question out of uh, ignorance. The, when I've heard about applying AI to writing, a lot of it seems to be about things like grading student papers. When I think about, uh, on the other hand, where the computers and writing movement came from, a lot of it was emphasis on trying to um, get through the really tough teaching and learning task of convincing students that writing was actually about uh, communicating with other people about something that matters. Yeah. Um, so my my intuition, my knee-jerk reaction is to be very cautious. Even even if all the only words I've heard are AI and composition courses, I'm wondering what um, applications of technology are interesting for the panel these days um, as ways of um, getting students learning to communicate authentically um, and to, uh, to motivate students uh, to, the, to the work on writing, which in, in my past, those two things have been very closely related. Uh, if you can get students convinced that they're trying to communicate with somebody about something that matters, um, that is motivation. Uh, it can, certainly can be motivation to work harder uh, and less mechanically. Um, less thinking that this is a game of making teachers happy or mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. scoring points or something. Um, that, that's a great, great so, problem. Please. I'd like to share something. And Steve, it's good to see you again. Uh, I just saw a presentation by a writing instructor from Savannah State. And uh, she was talking about, you know, she gets in students who are not good writers. And actually, one of her first assignments is, she says, I want you to tell me a story. I want you to use text. That's what the students use. She said, we're not grading grammar. We're not grading spelling or anything. Tell me a story. And what she gets out of that is, Steve, getting at that very kind of authentic, this is the way I communicate. This is what I talk, uh, the, way I, the, the way I communicate now. And taking that and then saying, OK, here's the core of your story. Now let's see what we can do. Let's see if we can get that into standard English. What would that look like uh, as a way to communicate that? And I, I, I just thought that was just such a brilliant way to start with where students are and not it, it's the low stakes. If there's no judgment uh, about what you're doing, even, even on the grammar, the spelling side, which would have been a gift to me back in college. Uh, and, and then to bring that and use technology then to say, okay, well, let's run it through Grammarly. 
what's Grammarly going to say about that? Do we agree with that? Yeah. Is that the way we want to do this? So I, I thought it was an interesting way of taking uh, the assignment and kind of flipping it around. I agree, Preston. Yeah, and thank you, Mike. Any anybody else from the panel want to uh, want to engage with Stephen? Or did Stephen just well, kill I'll, I'll all discussion? A, I'm going to prompt Elizabeth on that because Elizabeth wrote the foreword uh, to our report. All right, I'll bring. And, I'll bring and her talked up. a little bit about her feelings about that. Well, and she, I, as, as she as you're doing that. Uh, I do want to say there's also a second report that we did because going through the first one, we found a whole lot of new kind of positions people talked about. We're going to need a digital ethicist. We're going to need uh, a data scientist. We need a learning engineer, a learning analyst that Karen talked about. So our second publication there out of this, this work uh, followed on uh, really looking at kind of the new positions we might be seeing in the future. But Excellent. we're always going to rely on faculty. So I'll turn it over to Elizabeth. Well, Mike, let me, let me bring up Elizabeth, and then I want to circle back to what you just said, and I'll share a link to that in the chat. Um, and Elizabeth has the best background, as she knows. I'm just absolutely in love with the tree behind her. <laughs> uh, given your comment earlier, I feel like I should set some, some f fake birds on it. Anyway, um, uh, so... I'm thinking about this idea of student motivation and engagement and sort of what the 21st century student um, sort of is all about. And the idea that writing is a risky subject. Um, it doesn't matter who you are and, and how much you have written in your life or how little you've written in your life or what, what your experience in your writing life has been. Um, you probably carry some baggage with you. Um, unfortunately, that's the nature of, of the beast. And so when students come to a writing class, they carry with them um, negative experiences, negative feedback, uh, anxieties and worries, um, just as maybe as professional writers, we, I don't know, maybe we have some of those too. And, and so this idea that there may be a way for students to engage in a lower risk environment without having to just uh, rely on instructor feedback or even peer feedback um, to maybe get some small wins, to build their confidence about their ability to write small passages, to analyze a piece of text, to um, maybe do something that's a little bit fun, create you know a game about writing, heaven forbid. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. You know, teach them rhetorical principles in a way that would be interesting to them. Maybe using digital, um, uh, like a, a digital example with audio and video from a social medium that they engage with on a daily basis. Uh -huh. And so, using technology to sort of serve some of that content and to allow them to get some feedback on their writing in that really low stakes way. Um, is, I think, a really powerful contribution. Now, writing teachers have been doing that for years in um, sort of face-to-face -face classes and in old school ways. Uh -huh. But again, there's only so much one person can do in the context of a classroom setting. And so having the technology take on an integral role while retaining the uh, role of the instructor, I think, is, is the promise of this work. Um, I hear the peril, but it's in the back of my mind, but, but I think there's some, there's some promise here. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I, I love the way that it balances it. And thank you, Stephen, for, uh, for the great question. Mm -hmm. Let me, uh, let me boot you off and, uh, bring, bring Rob back up so that we've got, uh, the, the panel uh, all together. Um, and I wanted to circle back to what Mike was just talking about. Uh, Mike was just talking about, uh, this other paper and, uh, I'll put a link to that in the chat so everyone can see it. Um, because this is uh, um, uh, definitely a subject of a great deal of interest. And, um, and in fact, um, let me see. Um, I'll, I'll bring Mike back up just because he, he mentioned this, just to get started again. But this is a fascinating paper about how staffing changes on campus, that if you take digital forward design seriously, that we need a whole series of new and or different roles. Um, and. Mike, do you, do you want to lead us off about this and then and then hand it off to one of your confers? Sure, sure. You know, it, it turns out that uh, faculty didn't uh, start out their career as wanting to be a an LMS learning management software administrator, uh, <laughs> tech uh, support desk for students, and it, it, they 
don't all have a love uh, of learning uh, of, of data science. Uh, and, you know, with, with all of these tools, one part, one reason for using all of these tools is they provide a lot more empirical data uh, that we can really uh, begin to understand at a much more finely grained and immediate and uh, technology manageable level uh, huh. what's going on with students. So, you know, it, it really, uh, as things grow more sophisticated, it's going to take much more of a team. And I think what I'll do is maybe hand this off to, to Rob Cadle because Rob uh, really uh, took a, a substantial lead uh, in the thinking through of how we were going to do that workshop and, and where we ended up. We got some really kind of interesting findings out of that, I think. Oh, great. Uh, welcome back, Rob. And thank you, Mike. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the 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 idea when when we came uh, when when Mike and I started talking with Karen and others about that uh, staffing workshop, um, one of the the questions was sort of like, well, we don't even know necessarily what these these job titles would be because we wanted to kind of figure out, you know, what what is a learning engineer exactly? What is that going to mean? And of course, it's it's going to have variable meanings. So so we did actually. Um, create a survey for the participants in that workshop where we asked them to kind of give us some feedback, uh, not just on the, the terminology, but also on, you know, what what are the types of, of, um, of KSAs, if you will, knowledge, skills, and abilities that you would need to have on hand, even if they didn't have a particular uh, title for it in order to do these things. And... Um, it was really interesting to me when we started to get some of their their feedback in. We started to look through some of these responses. That uh, one of the things that that kind of bubbled up to the top, uh, I think, second just behind uh, obviously needing a, a, a faculty member for for helping to design a course, was a learning experience designer. Somebody who was going to say um, that there is there is more to um, learning, whether it's writing or, or anything else, than just putting the curriculum out there and teaching. Uh, and that to make it a more effective, um, uh, to, to make for more in effective instruction, you do have to think of it like an experience. And now, you know, we are starting to see some of these, these programs, graduate programs that are in instructional design and so forth that are starting to, to have, um, you wouldn't really call them a minor in a graduate program, but you know, sort of a concentration area that's in learning experience design, or or that is in some sort of course engineering or something like that. Um, it's it's always the way I think that that we we tend to identify a need that already exists, and then in higher ed we have to respond to it by coming up with a program that helps to teach that. Uh, but I think with, yeah. with digital forward course design, that's that's more relevant than ever. Well. Thank you, uh, thank you for that uh, for that description. Uh, by the way, in in the in the chat, uh, Sarah San Gregorio has had a couple of really important comments. Uh, she points out that learning uh, designers uh, have seen excuse me instructional designers have seen uh, their roles in flux uh, for years, which is really really important. And then she adds, there's an emotional labor part of ID jobs that aren't in the descriptions, but relationships are a huge part of their jobs. Uh, and uh, so I want to put that out there, but then also add uh, our good friend George Station uh, asked uh, the question, has anyone, dis well, sorry, he asked, has anyone discussed ethics and the use of student data and how informed students are? And I'm wondering if, if, if you all could uh, take a whack at that. Um, and maybe uh, our ACLU, uh, I'm sorry, our APLU uh, comrades, would you like to uh, uh, say a word about that or one of, uh, one of our others? I'll defer to Karen for data stuff. <laughs> I was going to punt to Mike, but I will start. Okay. Um, uh, so, so uh, it's it's very difficult, and I'm slightly tongue tied, right? So, uh, um, we do think um, data privacy, particularly by institutions, is is paramount when working with technology um, companies. But there is a issue. Um, um, and I'm I'm really aware of it that many data companies, ed tech companies, uh, um, uh, uh, adaptive companies, actually don't have student profiles. Right? They have student data. 
And one of the things that uh, is missing is a way to join those two things, right? Because one of the things that we know about our national landscape right now is we do not have equitable outcomes. Uh -huh. And uh, um, in order to improve equity, we're going to have to know what's working and what's not working for um, the students in those equity populations. And so we've got to a, a, a carefully think about how do we help uh, and protect, how do we help um, ourselves get better um, at improving equity, um, protect the privacy of students, and uh, um, help these companies design better tools. That's not completely George's question, but I did want to bring that up as part of the conundrum that we're in. And given Mike's work in AI and with his new NSF grant, I wanted to punt to him because I know he's thought about this a lot. Well, it's thought about it a lot, but we haven't solved it. Uh, I, I think these are the real challenges. Uh, I'd say, you know, sometimes it's going to take a real uh, shift in our thinking as well. Uh -huh. uh, you know, we tend to think about like with a learning management system, something the school runs and that's where all the data is captured. We could be talking about cognitive assistance of our own by the students and that they control that. So that per PII is really on their device or in their tools that they're using and things so there are there are ways uh, that we'll be looking at and trying to address that uh, I, I remember there was a software association and someone asked uh, one of the developers uh, about accessibility uh, this was maybe seven or eight years ago and he said well if you're going to want us to be accessible it's going to really stifle innovation and I think that's the conundrum uh, that we're in uh, we're trying to innovate uh, we're trying to do it responsibly, yeah. uh, but it it uh, pushes boundaries. Well, thank you, thank you, uh, and George, thank you for that great question, and friends, thank you for that answer. We're almost out of time, and uh, I want to make sure that we get one last question in. Um, and this, and so we're almost out of time. I want to make sure it's here, and so if you have to speak quickly, we completely understand. This is from uh, Mary at Southern Maine, who says, from a faculty developer perspective. How do your institutions deal with so much of the burnout from faculty with all the technology since the pandemic? So, you know, doing digital forward design, thinking about staffing, how does faculty burnout because of the pandemic intersect with that? Okay, I'll start off and I'll talk quickly. Uh, <laughs> you know, those are, are some of the challenges. We're not, as I said before, we're not going to see less technology in the yeah. future. We're going to see more. Uh, and, you know, uh, other sides of that are that uh, some faculty are, uh, like with the great resignation, resisting going back into the classroom. Uh, they found that technology brings them some advantages. Uh, we shall see. Uh, I was in a, a meeting a couple of weeks ago in a very long, narrow boardroom. And there were probably, I was probably 30 feet away from the screen. We actually ended up uh, moving the meeting on Zoom just so all of us at the other end of the room could see the screen. Oh, wow. Uh, so I think we're gonna find ways to use the technologies we've become more comfortable with uh, in the pandemic era uh, to do more things with uh, when we're face to face. Well, that's, thank you. Um, that's, a, that's a good answer. Um, and. Uh, Anyone want to add to this uh, before we go? I'll say one quick thing. Please. Which is if we, um, I, I'm going to be optimistic and say, if we can find a way to design a, an adaptive platform that is really wow. unique to writing instruction that integrates these tools, maybe we don't have to go to the latest, greatest thing every week, but instead we have more one-stop shopping um, for a writing class. And perhaps if the technology does something um, that supports student success, the teacher can focus on a smaller number of more critical tasks. Um, and in the absence of all of that, or in the meantime, a lot of coffee helps. <laughs> well, thank you for, for uh for that beautiful thought and for looping back to the uh, to the beginning. Uh, but we have to loop back to the beginning because we are, I'm afraid, at the end. 
Um, and this has been fantastic. You all have done such great work, and it's been terrific to, to see where you're going. Let me just ask you collectively, uh, how do we keep up with all of you, your 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 work? Is, do you have a, a, a single website? Is the APLU the best place to find you? Or, or what, what's the best way to keep up with your next steps? I would say the APLU site, Karen, you can mention it. I do want to say the original funding for this came through the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh -huh. uh, which uh, APLU directed. So we're grateful to them for trusting us to do some good work. Well said. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. I think collectively, probably APLU, but uh, we also work very closely with colleagues um, at uh, a network group called the Every Learner Everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and the everylearnereverywhere.org um, website um, contains even more uh, um, about um, caring for students, caring for faculty, uh, digital learning, um, equitable best practices. Uh, um, so. I, I that repository has grown even more than our own has. And so I would want to also add that in um, to the mix of pl uh, places where you can keep up with us. One other little plug is that for those of you that work closely with faculty, ASU is collaborating with APLU and other great sponsors like Bill and Melinda Gates to offer the uh, a remote connected faculty summit June 8th and 9th. It is totally free. Uh, for right. Faculty runs about three and a half hours uh, um, and um, lots of great sessions, um, including a few on writing, including a few on design and digital forward uh, types of techniques. So please share that with your networks as well. Indeed. If, if you've got a link, if you could toss it in the chat, that would be great. Thank you. Um, and, and friends, uh, with a great deal of regret, I, I have to wrap things up. Uh, Elizabeth, Mike, Karen, Rashawn, Rob, thank you for being our biggest panel and definitely one of our best. Um, please continue the great work and we, we look forward to hearing what happens next from all of you. Thank you all. But uh, don't go away, friends. I'm gonna clear the deck here just to really, really quickly, just to uh, be able to show uh, what we are doing next because uh, I wanna make sure that we don't lose track of, of, uh, of that. Um, and I want to thank you all uh, for your excellent, excellent uh, participation so far, for your great questions. Karen, thank you for the uh, link to the remote sent to the remote summit. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about these subjects, if you are really fascinated by what this means in terms of staffing, pedagogy, technology, and more, you can keep tweeting at us at FTTE or at me, Brian Alexander, or Shindig Events, or hit up my blog, uh, brianalexander.org, for more. Um, if you'd like to dive into our previous sessions where we've discussed all a variety of technology um, and, uh, and teaching, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Uh, if you'd like to keep up with our new topics uh, and uh, topics that we're continuing to develop, next week we have a session uh, for our book club on climate crisis and academia. So we'll be talking about that. We have sessions on inclusive teaching, public higher ed, supporting diversity in technology, and Web3 coming up. If you'd like to share with us some of your great work, just suit me a note, and I'll be glad to share with everybody else. In the meantime, thank you all again for a very, very terrific session. Thank you for all your thoughts. Uh, we're coming into the summertime. I hope that means that some of you get to be warmer. I hope you get to be not too warm. Above all, I hope you're safe. Take care. We'll see you online next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>